Welcome to another edition of Inside Drew Miami Medicine. I'm Ongi Ford, Dean and Chief Academic Officer of the University of Miami Leonard M. Miller School of Medicine. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Maria Abreu, Director of Crohn's and Colitis Center at the Miller School, and also Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Medicine and Professor of Medicine, Microbiology, and Immunology. Just about an expert in everything GI. Dr. Abreu, welcome. Hi, Dean. I am so delighted that you have joined me this day, today in this podcast. Before we actually get into the, the, your brilliant work, I'd love to tell your, this audience a little bit about yourself, about your journey and how you got to be the vice chair of education or professor of microbiology, medicine, and so forth, immunology. Well, I could lie to you and tell you it was all part of a grand plan. Uh, but, um, you know, I had a lot of support from my family. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the firstborn of Cuban immigrants. And I think it's not a coincidence that from a very early stage, there's a lot of emphasis placed on, on, on education, on education as a way to improve your life and circumstances. Um, I had a wonderful example from my parents. My mother was a school teacher. And my father had been a farmer in Cuba, but in the United States, you know, um, as he liked to say, he learned one word of English and forgot two. So he worked in a factory when I was growing up. And I... I think about those times as really being formative. You know, it's defined who I am. I think nowadays um, kids are, are told, you know, do something that makes you happy. Um, and I think that in reality, maybe I'm more practical than that. Maybe um, what, what was instilled in me is do something that's purposeful, that is going to give you security. And then, of course, the love comes later. Kind of no different than a, than a relationship. I'm I'm very fortunate, of course, because I, I know you know me and I love what I do. But that's not an accident, right? Um, I um, I I try to get into anything that I've decided I'm going to put my mind to. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to do the best that I can, and um, and I think that um, that background uh, really has been in, in my way of thinking better than having grown up. Sure. Wealthy or with other with other things. It's just, tell me, how did this background, this humble background, um, guide you towards a, a career in medicine and, and as a brilliant researcher? Well, I think you know, in in my culture, uh, not coincidentally, I'm a doctor. My brother's an engineer. Those are the things that um, that people did. Those are the things that people aspired to to. Um, uh, I guess to elevate yourself, to elevate yourself. And it's a community, you know, I grew up, um, I was actually born and raised in New Jersey in what amounts to being the second largest community of Cubans uh, outside of Cuba, uh, after Miami, of course. And it was a very tight-knit community, um, so, so much so, and such a recent immigration when I, was, when I was a child, that when I started kindergarten, I didn't speak English because... No one at home spoke English. I, it's fascinating, right, how you could not know any better. Uh, on the flip side, what an advantage that is, right? Um, because my English is pretty good. And, and of course, I can communicate now, especially now that I'm back in Miami. Um, it adds this dimension of being able to communicate with my patients and with people in their native language. Just yesterday, I was doing a colonoscopy on a young man that I hadn't met. That's an unusual thing. Most of the people that I'm scoping are people that I've known and I've gotten a chance to meet when they still have their clothes on. And um, I didn't know, you know, I, I said to him, what, what do you feel more comfortable in? He goes, well, I understand English, but I'd much prefer if you speak to me in Spanish. And the power of that to make someone comfortable before they're going to have a procedure, all those things are things I need to be grateful to my family for. Outstanding. Tell me, how did you decide to come to the University of Miami for yeah, your studies? Yeah. Well, like a lot of, of Cuban families, we eventually got to Miami. That was the goal, right? Was to get closer to Cuba, I suppose, or something. So we were in Miami. I, I you know, went to high school here and um, was very active in high school in a million different organizations and all that stuff, including, by the way, 
I come to this medical campus to do research when I was this little kid, you know, to uh, while while in high school. And so that got me started on, you know, wanting to do research even when I grew up. And so I applied broadly to universities and was lucky I got accepted to every university I applied to, all these Ivy League universities. And yet I got accepted to the six-year medical program here at the University of Miami, which was in its, almost in its inception, actually, because I am quite old. So it was really at the very beginning of that journey for that six-year medical program, maybe the I don't know, second or third group of kids that were accepted into that program. Um, because, you know, when you're a kid, you think, oh, my goodness, you know, it seems so long to you. Everything seems so long to you. Two years, you know, seems like a long time, four years, even longer. So I wanted to shave some of that time so I could get so I can get into medical school. Of course, you know, uh, at my age now, that's a rounding error. So I don't think that would have been necessary. Nevertheless, um, as you well know from, from leading from leading our medical school, I think we've always had a fantastic medical school. I think our, our medical students graduate with enormous skills. And um, that was clear to me because I, I was accepted to do my residency um, at Brigham and Women's Hospital in internal medicine. And I was put in the, in the medical ICU as my first rotation, right? And I can tell you that I knew, I knew what to do because I trained here, right? I remember getting a central line kit because we decided on rounds that, you know, the, the patient needed a central line. And they all said, well, what are you, what are you doing? I said, well, you said he needed a central line, right? So I went to get the central line kit and I was ready to do it. And clearly not everyone had that kind of training. And not just, of course, the kind of like what to do, but why you do it and all that, which I think is um, what makes the Brigham famous is, is really kind of the thoughtful process of deliberation and debate that occurs about everything in medicine. Yeah, you, I, I know you come across so humble, but uh, in reality, you are one of the most brilliant graduates of the Nova School of Medicine. And, and let's just acknowledge it, recognize it, and get beyond that. Um, so we successfully recruited you back yeah. uh, after doing a fellowship at uh, UCLA and then working at Cedar sinai and also at Mount Sinai. Tell us, what made you decide to want to come back to the middle school as a faculty member? I decided to come back because I really felt at that particular time in our history as a university that there had been this colossal change. Mm -hmm. And the colossal change was this importance in... Uh, what I view as academic medicine and research and really trying to um, advance the fields. We had always been a great medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, we had not had very much of a research operation back then when I was a student. And in fact, it took me a long time um, to think about and to, to say, when is the right time to come back? You know, there's always the pull of home, the gravitational pull of home. Not just, I don't, I don't mean only my family, but really the community, this, this important community, and really the university. Because the skills that I brought, I needed to be able to, to put them into play if I, was gonna, if I was going to help us as a medical school and as a university. And I thought the timing was that, was that. That was the beginning of our transformation, I feel, as a medical school. Because you came back, uh, your presence has truly been transformative. Uh, you've established uh, the the Crohn's and Colitis Center at the University of Miami. Um, and now uh, I understand we are home to the largest database of um, Crohn's disease in uh, Hispanic patients. So tell us a little bit about that and, and, and why you decided to focus on that, yeah. pop on that population. Right. Well, since my fellowship training, and, and I, I actually chose a fellowship track that was research-based. So, you know, I had clinical a clinical year and then research time in a laboratory that focused on inflammatory bowel disease. Mm -hmm. And um, at, at present, there are reasonably few people that try to combine clinical work mm -hmm. with the basic and translational work um, to give us the pathogenic insights, really, into Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So I've always been doing... Uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis clinically and, and, and with respect to research in every place that I've been. What made Miami interesting and novel was the 
the discovery that almost half of the patients that we care for are Hispanic, either born in Latin America or both parents are from Latin America and they're, they're American born. So it's like an epidemic as far as I'm concerned. I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, so we, I, we lack the data to tell you real incidence rates in this community. But it's crazy how many people we see with these disorders that are, are the first in their family developing inflammatory bowel disease. So that rate mm-hmm. is clearly rising in, in, in Hispanics and Hispanic immigrants. This is what, what, what I do is I, you know, I want to understand what causes this. So how do you get to the root of what causes it? You, you, need, um, you need patient material right, mm-hmm. to, to inform that. Mm-hmm. And so from really the beginning of, of coming here, I established a biorepository. Our patients are very generous mm-hmm. um, in consenting to collecting very detailed clinical data. Mm-hmm. We collect their DNA for genetic research. We collect RNA from whole blood mm-hmm. um, serum. And if they're having a procedure done, we also collect biopsies mm-hmm. in a protocolized way from you know various places in their intestine. We collect stool samples at the time of colonoscopy. Mm-hmm. We collect blood. So we have a very, not just the number of people that are in our biobank, but the depth of the, the data and the granularity of the data, I think, is also, as, as I now get to see what other people have, very um, uh, a very compelling data set. We we just got awarded a colleague in, uh, from the from the, the Husman Institute for Genetic Research, Jake McCauley and I, a, a grant from the NIH. We're now part of mm-hmm. um, uh, a UO one that's called the IBD Genetics Consortium. Great. They only have um, seven spots for researchers in the United States to participate. And we had had an ancillary grant a few years ago, but now the NIH has made a commitment to trying to understand the genetics in populations that aren't just of European descent. And so blacks have been underrepresented in this biobank and Hispanics have been underrepresented in this biobank. And obviously we're, we, we were chosen because of the, you know, how, how rich a resource we have already established and the possibility for, again, collecting even more samples from Hispanic patients in the United States. That, that, that's great. It's a great segue. So tell, tell me about what we know right now about the genetics of IBD and uh, the pathogenic processes that lead to the right. manifestation of the right. disease. Right. Well, when we talk about IBD, you know, we're talking about two disorders for all intents and purposes, Crohn's mm-hmm. disease and ulcerative mm-hmm. colitis. Mm-hmm. As it turns out, genetically, these two disorders are very related. Most of the genes are in common and only select genes actually separate the, those two diseases, mm-hmm. obviously in the final clinical expression of where these mm-hmm. patients are going to have inflammation, mm-hmm. with Crohn's being characterized by having you know, small intestinal inflammation. Mm-hmm. Of course, they can have colonic inflammation as well, but there are other characteristics, transmural disease, you know, kind of hearkening back to your medical school days for many, for many of our listeners, and ulcerative colitis that only involves the colon. But again, they're very related disorders genetically. There's been a lot of advance in that in the genetic understanding. Um, the latest manuscript that you know our group participated in is over 240 individual genes with polymorphisms that contribute to the risk of developing IBD. But that isn't enough. That probably only explains about 20% of why people get it. We know that because um, even identical twins, there's only about a 20% chance that the other twin is going to develop ulcerative colitis. It's a little higher with Crohn's disease, but there's clearly um, there's clearly other stuff. And what is that other stuff, right? The other stuff is likely very heavily dependent on on our environment and our microbiome. I think the microbiome is in, in a way like a rheostat. It senses, it interpolates all this stuff that has happened in our lifetime. You know, whether it was antibiotic use or you know, um, uh, you know the the food that we ate, uh, whether we got breastfed or not. All these things ultimately have an impact on the microbiome, and ultimately contribute importantly to the to the susceptibility to developing IBD, and and probably even to you know the perpetuation and all of the complications that our patients might have with inflammatory bowel disease. Excellent. So so, so in essence, it's really the exposome, the exposome. that ultimately determines if you get the disease. And, and, and tell me, is it true that um, 
uh, Hispanic patient um, um, who lives in Latin America, uh, um, who then migrates here, has a higher likelihood of developing IBD, uh, or whether it's Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, as a result of exposure to the environment, at the, the, the exposome, as we just talked about? So we, we don't have great epidemiologic data from Latin America. We do know that in urban centers, I'm thinking about right now as I say this to you, about Colombia, about Brazil, there's a rising rate in those countries. I believe, however, that if you take those same individuals who don't have it in their native country and bring them to the United States, we jumpstart their risk of developing IBD. I have a wonderful colleague here at the University of Miami who's a K Award recipient. Her name is Oriana Damas. And Oriana has my one of our my favorite papers. Not that it was like in, you know, it was in a good journal, but the story is a really interesting one. She looked only at Cuban immigrants. Mm-hmm. And the reason we looked only at Cuban immigrants was you figure they're stuck on an island. The gene pool isn't changing, right? There's not a contamination that way. Their diet is relatively monotonous, relatively monotonous. And then you bring them here to South Florida, right? And what you found was if you look at immigrants from Cuba from the 1950s to the early 80s, it took on average 30 years for the person from the time they arrived to develop symptoms of IBD. After the mid-90s, the average time is seven years from the time they arrive here to the time they develop IBD. To me, suggesting that something in our environment, in our exposome here, is really jump-starting that risk. Of course, you could also say, and I think it's also partially true, that there are things changing on the island, including that they're, that they're being far more exposed to processed foods, ultra-processed foods, which is now kind of becoming a theme, a theme in our world of IBD, but a theme in our world, period, uh, that is making us at risk for a lot of different things. So, so clearly, I think that um, your point is, is a great one. There's a really cool study from uh, um, Thailand where they studied people before they left Thailand, then after they came to the United States, and then over the ensuing years. And it only took six months for their microbiome to change after arriving in the United States. Is that amazing? And so by one generation, they really looked like European Americans that had been here for, for a very long time. Not in a good way, by the way. You know, obesity, diabetes, and all these complications had already set in. So in the, we know that there's a multiplicity of factors that may affect uh, the microbiome and um, let, let's focus a little bit on, on, on diet because you are focusing on that as a particular uh, area of, of, of potential intervention. What do we know about that in, in diet in IBD? Well, my interest in diet actually comes near and dear to your heart, Dean, because it came out of an interest in studying toll receptor signaling. You know, you and I share an interest in innate immunity and, and, the, and what impact it has on the gut and inflammation. And from that sprung this notion that, hey, maybe fat and certain saturated fatty acids might be activating toll receptors locally in the gut causing inflammation. That led me to, and, and, and my group to say, what about high fat diets and, and all that? And so we started trying to understand that in mice, you know, mice is a very artificial system. So we, we then started to try to see this, could we do this in humans? And ask the question in a kind of a control, in as controlled a way as possible in humans. So we did a study uh, where we took ulcerative colitis patients that were doing pretty well, and we gave them a low fat, high fiber diet, or we gave them a standard American diet, aka high in fat and low in fiber. We discovered so many things. By the way, we catered the food, so we had a lot of control over what they were eating. We made even the, even this standard American diet that we fed our patients turned out to be a lot healthier than what these patients were eating at baseline. These are people with GI disorders, right? But through misinformation and quite frankly, just the society that we live in, they hardly ate any fruits and vegetables. Uh, they had a lot of animal fat in their diet and they, they had improvements in quality of life and other symptoms 
really with both diets, but of course more with the low fat, high fiber diet. We're in the midst of doing a similar type of study in Crohn's right now. And of course, the scary part about that is that when, you know, in, in Crohn's disease, as you well know, as a surgeon, one of the complications is stricturing of the small bowel. Yes. And, and so often patients are told to eat a low fiber diet. So of course we're doing, you know, a diet that's high in soluble fibers and other things that, and so far, you know, knock wood, people have tolerated this diet that we've given to our Crohn's patients. So we're, so we're excited to see what the ultimate results will show. Uh, um, we have, we're doing a deep dive into the microbiome, into the metabolome of these, of, of these patients that we're giving this diet to, um, compared to patients that got dietary advice one time, and then we're following them in parallel. Um, other people have done other types of studies. Um, the, a Mediterranean diet seems to be a good approach in people with Crohn's disease. Um, there is a very well done study that compared a Mediterranean diet to something called a specific carbohydrate diet. I'm not sure that it has any other utility except in IBD, where it's a very draconian diet that only allows them to have almond flour, no nothing with sugar, basically nothing with sugar. And it has some, you can understand the benefit, right? That sugar, in theory, is going to allow for growth or overgrowth of certain bacterial populations that might be harmful. But again, it's at the expense of really kind of very being very draconian and changing the microbiome, not necessarily all in good ways. So you think that uh, perhaps the pathway to altering clinical disease could be in manipulating your diet? You know, patients, we have made a lot of advances in IBD. Mm -hmm. That would be a whole podcast, right? And yeah. so that's great. It doesn't get us all the way there. In other words, we, we, don't, we, we certainly don't make 100% of people better. Even when we think we've done an awesome job because their intestines have no ulcers, people still have symptoms. And finally, people don't want to be on our drugs, right? They, they, you know, the, the public has become leery of, of things that, you know, biologics and drugs that, that, you know, that they consider have risks. I, I'm, I don't, I actually think that these drugs are great and we're a great advance. So diet is probably the most common question we get. What should I eat, right? Can I control this with diet? And my answer is usually, we can, we, you, you can make your symptoms better with diet for sure. And it's a complement to these medications that we use to try and see if we could complement the, the immune, immune uh, um, strategies that we use in our, in our biologics with something that will change the microbiome. Event, not eventually. There's, the first, um, there's now one FDA-approved microbiome product that's for C. diff. That's for C. diff. C. diff is, as, as you probably know, much easier to treat. You can, you know, like do one fecal transplant, or in this case, it's, it's like a fecal transplant that, that is the strategy and, and prevent another recurrence of C. diff. It turns out not to be so simple for IBD. For IBD, um, the studies that have looked at fecal microbial transplant for IBD, it's really worked best in ulcerative colitis, and it's worked best if you have multiple donors pooled together to, in, in my way of thinking, we know so little about what's missing in a, in a patient. And it might be individual, by the way. It might be something quite individual, that if we had a better way to decide, okay, this is what's missing for this particular patient, let's replace that, we could have much better efficacy. So that's, those are the kinds of things that hopefully we'll be teasing out in the ensuing years to understand how we can use microbiome-based therapies and maybe microbiome combined with diet, right? Would be the coolest. Truly really fascinating, very, very fascinating. So in addition to being a, a, a fantastic clinician and, and a researcher with seminal contributions in the field of IBD, you are now a national leader in the American Gastroenterological Association. Tell us about that. You are vice president and soon to be president in 2024. I know. Who could believe that? I, I almost can't believe that. And the first Latina. The first, yeah. So tell us a little bit about that journey and what does the AGA represent? Because that is the largest organization representing yeah. gastroenterologists. Yeah. And, and then tell us about the membership because it's a big deal. 
Yeah, well, this is this. It's certainly it's the oldest American organization for gastroenterology. It's been around for over 120 years. I'm I'm the fifth woman to be in to well you know, to eventually be the president. Actually, there was a, a woman president very early on when GI was really kind of not a thing. You know, there was really very little to do and very little knowledge. It wasn't about scoping and doing all the things that we think about in gastroenterology at the moment. I mean, I. I'm humbled and honored to do it. I've been involved in the AGA since I was a kid, really, since I was a kid. I joined as a fellow, and even as a fellow was, was first put on the research committee, like sitting alongside extremely famous people in the field of GI and, and reading grants and learning from them. And that led to you know more kind of involvement in the, in the organization. Um, I, uh, for, for years, was in charge of the committee that organized our, our national meeting every year, which, which is a, a lot of work and a very important charge. And I think as a result of having played so many different roles in the AGA, uh, when it came to evaluating, it's, you know, you're evaluated by a committee, a nominating committee that chooses who's going to be the vice president. I didn't get a chance to ask them, why'd you pick me? But I, I think it could very well be that I had insight into a lot of different aspects of gastroenterology and, and the field of gastroenterology and our organization. At the end of it, um, what my hope is that I will leave a lasting, you know, a legacy in, uh, during that time as president. In particular, I want to make sure that our field is equitable for women. We have an explosion now of women coming into the field of gastroenterology. I, I think that there is this exponential thing that occurs when you have a certain core group of women that other women can say, wow, I can do that. I want to be like that person. It attracts these, you know, all these young women to the field. So it's going to be a younger crowd of women. Women, as far as I can tell, are the only ones that can have children. And therefore, we, and it's all during this peak of their career and, and all that jazz. So we have to find ways that we can, as a field, incorporate and, and have women be self-actualized in their roles as gastroenterologists and not leave the field because we're crushing them with work. Because not coincidentally, patients want to see women. Women want to get scoped by women. Women patients want to see women. And the average colonoscopy length is longer for women patients. Therefore, you can already begin to do the math that women are going to start behind the eight ball, women gastroenterologists. So all these things are things that I think about. And only 20% um, of the gastroenterologists in the country are women. Isn't that's that right. Correct? That's right. Now, so we have a gap to close. That's right. 100%. And, and then they have a fantastic role model who can inspire them to do likewise. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I'll do my best. I'll do my best as, as uh, cheerleader in chief. Do you have a theme or platform you want to introduce and to uh, achieve your goals for diversity? And We have diversity goals. I think that we, we need to deconstruct what is the problem. I think for women, um, the field of gastroenterology is very rapidly changing. Now, enormous GI groups are forming that are owned by private equity. And I want to make sure women aren't lost in that shuffle. And I think we as a society can give them the tools, whether it is how to negotiate contracts, having white papers on what should be expected of an organization that hires women gastroenterologists in terms of maternity leave and other things. When I started looking at the data, it's crazy how little maternity leave is offered, how women in their fellowship are made to, in, in many programs I'd like to, not ours, make up all their call before they deliver so that they can take the time off after after they deliver. I, I just think it, the thought of that makes me upset, but I also feel that that we need to guide. We need to guide. And what, what's great about the AGA is we're intimately involved in fellowship training so we can have a, an effect at all levels that women are coming into the field. Now... Now, in some programs, more than half of the fellows are women. So this this is going to shift pretty quickly. And I want, as a society, for us to be ahead of that game, that we're not just being reactive to the fact that, oh, gosh, we now have all these women. What are we going to do? How are we going to structure? You know, as 
I mean, guys got there first, right? So everything we do for all intents and purposes in medicine in general is predicated on what was convenient and logical if you had only men in the, in the workforce. And so it's nobody's fault. It just needs to evolve. And this is like the Galapagos. It's going to have to evolve like pretty quickly so that we can, um, so we can have successful women in our field. And what a shining example of exactly that. That's what you represent. Um, and, and, and clearly an, an inspiration to all the other women who are coming behind and seeing you. And, and in fact, um, here you've accomplished so much and I'm the pinnacle of the AGA. And yet you just took a sabbatical to acquire even more tools to be more effective. Tell us about that in the closing moments, and because I think it really epitomizes what you're all about and, and why you are such a powerful example, not only for women, for everyone else in academic medicine. Well, I then need to begin with a thank you, because you gave me permission to, to do that sabbatical. People aren't necessarily keen to have you leave your job for a few months. You know, it was actually six months in total. I decided to spend them in Rome, and I decided to focus on two things while I was on the sabbatical. One was on acquiring more microbiome knowledge. You can tell that I'm, I'm passionate about the microbiome and diet. And I wanted to understand better what are the tools for analysis of the microbiome, which turns out to be quite complex. And I've made wonderful relationships during that time. And already we're generating data from this diet intervention study that we're doing in collaboration with my with my newfound friends in, in, in Rome. The other thing I... I chose to focus on was learning to do intestinal ultrasound. So it turns out that um, this started in Italy. You know, if you, if you know about abdominal ultrasound, most of the time we think about bowel gas as interfering with doing a good abdominal ultra, ultrasound. So some women gastroenterologists in Rome had the idea like, well, maybe we can actually see some of the bowel and take advantage of this, the bowel gas and other things that we thought were a problem. Maybe they're a strength. And so they are bravissime in doing, in doing ultrasound for, for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It's not invasive. It's not painful. It's not getting an MRI machine, a noisy MRI machine for two hours with an IV in your arm. It's not having a colonoscopy done. And so it's a great advantage for patients. Um, the vision would be to have it as a point of care test. Someone comes in to see me. They're having symptoms. I want to see if they have inflammation. I could do an ultrasound on the spot. We probably will also do it as a referral thing that patients who really are leery to have a colonoscopy can have an ultrasound done. Obviously, it doesn't replace all of that, mm -hmm. but it's an alternative to that. And, um, and I think that it's really important that we lead this in the United States because some of the things that confront us uh, in every dimension, whether it's payers or, um, or, ob or obesity, quite frankly, in our, in our patient population compared to European populations needs to be dealt with here at home so we can understand the full potential for this. But you know what's so funny about what you said? I remember that on the last night when, when you know, they took me out for dinner, pizza, but like super high-end pizza <laughs> in Rome, they invited, you know, some of the fellows, some of the, the, the fellows from the hospital that I was at, which is Gemelli, often in the news actually with, when, when there's a hospital talked about in Rome, Jamelli is always uh, often on the news. And um, one of the residents, said, one of these GI residents said to me that all the residents were fascinated that I, at my stage of my career, would come to be a student again, basically, and to try to learn something new. That that wasn't a common thing there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable. Like I would say to the patients that I'm the oldest studentessa in the hospital because, you know, I was obviously learning alongside these kids how to do how to do this technique. So it's forcing yourself, I think, to always be uncomfortable, to be uncomfortable and to start from scratch. And and I'm okay with that. Without question, you epitomize one of the overarching priorities that we try to impart to our students, the concept of lifelong learning, education for life. And and, and you clearly uh, evidence that uh, it's important. And, and, and even at the so-called later stages of life, you are still able to uh, acquire new skills and to contribute to the field. So you are such an inspiration, an inspiration to me. And it's been a privilege to have this opportunity to talk to you. So this has been yet another edition of Inside Your Miami Medicine. 
We were fortunate to have been able to talk to Dr. Maria Abreu, the Vice Chair for Research, and just a brilliant scientist altogether and clinician. So thank you for joining thank us you. today. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.